Hi, this is George Antonio, the pastor of Hope Baptist Church, and today we're going to be looking at uh, how can Jesus Christ be God and man at the same time. That is the number one question on a lot of people's minds, and it's uh, interesting to think that, to note rather, that most religions will agree that Jesus Christ existed and that he was a good man, but that he was not God. They'll all agree on the fact that he was not God. They differ on many different things, but they agree on that. So if you ask Jehovah's Witness, they'll say Jesus was the Son of God, kind of, because he's an angel, but he's not God. Mormons say he was a spirit brother with Lucifer, but he's not God. Islam says that he was a prophet, but he's not God. Hinduism and Buddhism, he's uh, you know, an advanced and ascended master, an enlightened guru, but he's not God. A humanist will say that he was a great humanistic teacher, revolutionary and whatnot, but he's not God. In Druze, the Druze religion will talk about Jesus Christ as a philosopher, but he's not God. The way international, he's not God. How come all those different religions, they are differed drastically on many points, often go to war against each other, and yet they all agree on this one fundamental truth, that Jesus Christ is not God. If you ask me personally, that's for me one of the strongest evidence that the Lord Jesus Christ is God in the flesh because the devil does not want you to know that he's God because if you do not believe that Jesus Christ is God, you cannot be saved. He told the Pharisees and John, or the Jews in John chapter 8, he says, "Ye shall die in your sins if ye believe not that I am he. That is a reference back to Jehovah God, I am that I am. If you don't believe that Jesus is Jehovah God in the flesh, the creator of the heavens and the earth, then you cannot be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, the Lord Jesus shall be saved. You must confess him as the Lord, not just Lord. And so people say, well, there are verses in the Bible that show that Jesus Christ was just a man. So if he's man, he cannot be God. And if he's God, he cannot be man. And see, the problem with that is just because my little three pound brain cannot understand the eternal truths of the Word of God does not mean that the doctrine is false. The problem with us is if we think if I cannot understand it, then it cannot be true. And so that means you're limiting God, who is by his nature limitless, down to your own level of understanding. That is sinful and that is in fact foolish. A man once said something that's very wise. He said, if I understood all of the Bible, then I would know that God did not write the Bible. Man wrote the Bible. Because if a human mind can fully understand the book, that means it's a human book. So let's agree that if God is eternal, the Bible says that he inhabiteth eternity. He's the eternal God. If God is eternal and I am limited I am limited in time and space and power and understanding, then of course there are some things that I'm not going to understand about God and that I'll just have to believe. How can I understand the infinite God? It doesn't make sense. Especially when you're talking about the very nature of God, like the Trinity, for example. When it comes to the Trinity, people say, well, I just don't understand it. It doesn't make any sense. Well, it doesn't make any sense to a fallen mortal human being. So what? It doesn't make sense to you, but it makes sense to God. It's still the truth. So let's look at some of those verses where Jesus Christ appears that, uh, you know, he's not God. And please keep in mind that the Bible itself, we're going to look at the scriptures because that's what we're supposed to do. We go to the scriptures. This is the word of God. This is the word of God. And Jesus Christ himself in John chapter 1 is called the word of God, also with a capital W. Now the Bible says about the written word of God in Hebrews chapter 4 that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. It's quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So the Bible has two natures basically. It is divine because it is given by inspiration of God, the Bible says. But it is also human because holy men of God spake as they were holy men of old spake as they were moved of the Holy Ghost. Holy men spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So the men is the human part and the ghost is the divine part. That book has two natures. And that's why 
people can look at it and say the Bible is written by men and they are that far correct. But you can also look at the Bible and say it was written by God and you would also be correct. And that's what throws off a lot of people, the twin natures of the Word of God. And just like the Bible has twin natures, the Lord Jesus Christ himself has twin natures. You see, the eternal Spirit of God was, the Bible says that he, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us in John 1.14. The Bible says that he was clothed with a vesture. God took on a human nature, and so he has two natures. See, that's what the Lord Jesus Christ was pointing to and what the Pharisees could not understand when he said in Matthew 22, the Lord himself pointed, used the fact that he had two natures. He hinted himself at it. In Matthew chapter 22, he's going to ask them a question they can't answer. Matthew 22, 41, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, what think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, the son of David. He saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord? Saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. The Lord Jesus Christ tells them that in Psalm 110, David called he said, the Lord said unto my Lord. So David called the Messiah his Lord. But the Messiah is the son of David. So how can David be calling his own son Lord? That doesn't make sense. And, there, and they couldn't answer. Neither can anybody answer that does not believe that the Messiah has two natures. And that's the key to the answer. It's because the Messiah is God. And therefore he is David's Lord. At the same time, when he became flesh, when he was born, the Messiah was the son of David, and so there he's a man. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ himself gave us the answer to that, that that's the correct interpretation in the book of Revelation, chapter 22, 16, and I'll put some of those on the screen so you can compare them. The verses are side by side. And so in Revelation 22, 16, he says, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches, I am the root and the offspring of David. So in the first part, he says he's the root of David. The root comes before the, the trunk and before the branch. And so he's saying, I was there before David. But then he says, I'm the offspring of David. The offspring comes after. How can he be before David and yet after? It's just like with John. John says, there cometh one after me who was before me. He's preferred before me, for he was before me. So he says, Jesus is coming after me, but in fact, he existed before me. It's the same thing that the Lord Jesus Christ told the Pharisees when he said in John chapter 8, before Abraham was, I am. He was before Abraham, and yet he's a son of David who came much after Abraham. He's before Abraham and after Abraham. He's before David and after David. He's before John and after John. How? He's before them in his deity because he's God. He's after them because in his humanity he came to earth 2,000 years ago. You see, on one side, look in Philippians chapter 2, for example. There the Bible says, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. There's the Godhood of Jesus Christ. He's equal with God. And then John chapter 5, verse 18 Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. There's the deity of Jesus Christ again. So we have people like the Jehovah's Witnesses, who are not really Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, they say, they'll quote verses like John chapter 14, verse 28. Ye have heard how I have said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye loved me, ye would rejoice, because I said I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And so... Muslims also and Jehovah's Witnesses will point to that verse and they'll say, well, there it is. Jesus said, my father is greater than I. But yet I showed you verses that say that Jesus is equal to God. In fact, they'll show you John 14, 28, where Jesus said, my father is greater than I. But they will ignore John chapter 10, verse 30, where he said, I and my father are one. And so you have, quote unquote, a Bible contradiction. How can Jesus say, my father is greater than I, 
and then say, I and my Father are one, and the Word of God says that He's equal with God, and how can Jesus make Himself equal to God? John chapter 5, verse 18. Again, the answer is, both are true. As God, in His divine nature, He's equal to God, and as man, He is not equal to God, in His human nature. It's very simple, friends. Now, look, um, I have two citizenships. I have a Lebanese citizenship and a Canadian citizenship. Now, if I am in a Canadian court, I function according to Canadian laws. I make my defenses based on the fact that I am a Canadian citizen. And I can stand up and say, I am a Canadian. And I am not Lebanese. Not in the eyes of a Canadian court. You understand? And in the Lebanese court, I cannot be a Canadian. I cannot say I am a Canadian. I can't make my defense. I can't... I can't that's not my identity there. I submit to Lebanese law. I have a Lebanese passport. I'm a Lebanese citizen. And so I have a dual citizenship. And it's not half a citizenship. I have all the full rights and privileges of a Lebanese citizen. And I have the full rights and the citizenship of a Canadian citizenship. And so Jesus Christ, in some cases, he speaks as a man. And in some cases, in some contexts, he presents himself as God, depending on the context. And again, if you say, I don't understand it, we've already established that. Just because you don't understand it does not mean it is not true. Yes, those are imperfect illustrations, but they help make the point. They help make the point. Some more examples. In John chapter 10, verse 36, this is the Godhood of Jesus Christ. He says, Say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. But then in John chapter 12, verse 23, Jesus answered them saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. He called himself the Son of Man. Son of God or Son of Man? Both. And so as the Son of God, he is divine in the sense that he is born of God. The offspring of a lion is a lion. The offspring of a man is a man. The offspring of God is God. And yet, the fact that he says the Son, that's when he became flesh and he took on a human nature. He partook of flesh and blood. So he added unto himself a new nature, which is a human nature, that does not cancel his divine nature. The devils understood that principle very well. In Mark chapter 1, verse 24, they would tell the Lord, saying, Let us alone, what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And then, but he also said, see, now look at the verse. I'm going to highlight different parts of the verse. They say, we have nothing to do, what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Jesus of Nazareth is a man. But then they say, I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Only one man is holy, only, not one man, only one person is holy. Only God is holy. He's called the Holy One of Israel. So on one side, the devil says, you're Jesus of Nazareth. On the other side, the devils would say, but I know who you really are. You're Jesus of Nazareth to the people. Lost people that don't know you, that's what they think. You're Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth. That's what the devils were saying. But we know who you really are. You're the Holy One of God. You see, even the devils recognized both natures. And if you can't, it's because the devils don't want you to recognize both natures. You cannot see into the spiritual world like they can. He illustrates the difference between the two also in John chapter 18. In John chapter 18, when they came to arrest him, when Judas brought the multitude to arrest him, <coughs> the Bible says, Judas then having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon then as they had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground when he said, I am he. Those are the words of the Tetragrammaton, Jehovah. That's how God revealed to himself to Moses in the bush. I am that I am, I am, I am he. When he said that, he spoke his deity. And they fell back. But the second time, in verse 7, Then asked he them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these there, uh, go their way. The second time, when he says, I told you that I am he, 
nothing happens. In fact, they arrest him. So why is it that the first time he said, I am he, everybody fell back? But the second time that he said, I am he, nothing happened. What's the difference? The first time that he said, I am he, he's declaring himself as Jehovah God. And when he spoke his deity, the spirit of deity came out of his mouth, like Job 26 speaks about, and they fell. The second time, forgive me, he said, I am he, just Jesus, the man. Again, <clears throat> our Muslims, Muslim friends will tell us, if Jesus is God, how can he be thirsty? <clears throat> because in John chapter 4, verse 7, the Bible says, There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. And on the cross, he said, I thirst. <clears throat> See, Jesus said, I thirst. See, Jesus said, Give me to drink. So Jesus is just a man. But they're not giving you the full story. You're not being given the full story, my friend. Jesus also said to the same lady, the Samaritan woman, he tells her, give me to drink in verse 7. So he's speaking as a man who's in need of water to drink, to live. And yet in verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto her, if thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him and he would have given thee living water from which you drink and you never die, he later on says in the passage. So in one verse he tells her, give me to drink. In the other verse he tells her, actually, you should be asking me and I could give you living water and you'd live forever. So when he says, give me to drink, he's speaking as a man. When he says, I give living water, he's speaking as God. Both natures, two in one. <clears throat> John chapter 4, verse 31, the same thing with the food. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him saying, Master, eat. But he saith unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. And he says, my meat is to do the will of my father. He doesn't need to eat to live. You know that because in the wilderness, he spent 40 days without eating or drinking and he remained alive. Now, of course, that supernatural help has happened with Moses and Elijah. But with Jesus Christ, as we've seen, there's something different there. That's because in his deity, he doesn't need to eat. And yet, the Bible says that when he was in the desert, in Matthew 21, Luke, Luke chapter 4, verse 2, that after 40 days... He was afterward, he afterward hungered. So he hungers in the wilderness. And yet the other time he tells the disciples, I don't need to eat. I have meat to eat that you know not of. How can that be? When he hungers, he hungers as a man. But does he doesn't really need it to eat, to live because he is God. Both natures. In Matthew 11, 25, he says, <clears throat> he rejoices. And he says, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. And verse 27, all things, all things are delivered unto me of my Father. So he has all revelation. Now that's very important. He says, all things are delivered unto me of my Father. Uh, he also said in John chapter 5, verse 20, the Father loveth the Son and showeth him all things that himself doeth. He also says in John 13, 3, that the Father hath given all things into His hands. All things. That takes deity. In 16, 15, He says, All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I, that He, the Spirit, shall take of mine and show it, shall show it unto you. He's saying, I know everything that the Father knows. The Father has revealed everything to me. And then the disciples understand that. In 16, 30, they say, Now are we sure that thou knowest all things. Peter tells him in John 21, 17, Lord, thou knowest all things. And yet, our Muslim friends and our JWs, Jehovah's Witnesses, and others, they'll say, look at Mark 13, 32. There, Jesus said, but of that day and that hour, about the second coming, knoweth no man, know not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. See, even the Son doesn't know when He's coming back. That's true. But He also said that he, the Father has revealed all things to Him without exception. How can that be? In his deity, he knows all things. In his humanity, he limits his knowledge. It's basically like uh, the son of a king coming. He is the representative of the state, of the state. He runs the state, but he is sent of the king, his father, in his capacity as an ambassador. And he wants to act in the office of an ambassador and not as potentate of the state. And so the king puts a sealed letter into the hands of his son and he says, deliver that. You have authority to read it, but just so they can accept you as an ambassador, don't read the letter. And so Jesus Christ 
in his humanity does not open the letter to know the day that he's coming back but he has the ability to flip it open and find out he just chooses not to so he can function as an ambassador below his actual level in line with the demands of that office and so as a man for Jesus the Bible says that he's touched with all with the feeling of our infirmities he took on flesh and blood to know what it's like to be a man and so he chooses to suffer thirst and hunger because we suffer thirst and hunger he chooses to limit his knowledge because we have limited knowledge he, he chooses to suffer to die because men die but he's doing that by his own strength not because he's not God because he's functioning as a man it's very simple in Luke chapter 22 verse 42 when he's praying to avoid the, 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 the wrath of God on the cross not the cross but the hell basically Luke 22 42 he prayed saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. As a man, he says, not my will, but yours. But as God, the leper in Matthew chapter 8, he says, Lord, if thou wilt, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Jesus says, I will. You know, that's blasphemous for any man to say. The greatest prophet that ever lived or preacher. It's not your will. You're there to do God's will. But Jesus Christ says, I will. He doesn't say my father. He says, I will. So sometimes, again, when he says, not my will, but thine be done, that's a man talking. When he says to the leper, I will be thou clean, and he is made clean, that's God talking. He forgives sins. That's God talking. John chapter, eight, John chapter 10, verse 18, when he's talking about his death on the cross, the Muslims say, how, if he's God, how can he die? He died in his humanity. You see, on the cross, look in John chapter 10, verse 18. He's talking about his life. And he says, No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. So as a man, he dies, but he says, I'm choosing to die. I have power. You don't have power over that. There is no power over the spirit, the book of Ecclesiastes says, in the day of death. He says, I have power to take it again. In the same verse, he says, I have power to lay it down so I can die as a man. But he also says, I have power to take it again. I can resurrect myself, he says. Laying it down, he dies as a man, taking it back of his own will at the commandment of the Father, but he takes it back. You can't do that. Even if God commanded you to do it, you couldn't do that. He can only do that because he's God. There is no man that hath power over the spirit to retain the spirit. That's what Solomon says. Neither hath he power in the day of death. And there is no discharge in that, war, in that war. And yet Jesus Christ says, I have the power. The wisest man that ever said, lived, he said, there's no man that hath the power over the spirit. Jesus says, I have the power. Why? Because as God, he has the power and he chooses to die as a man physically. Physically. His spirit didn't die. His flesh the robe of flesh that he took on died. And so you see those verses there where at one point he's man, at one point he's God. Sometimes he's man, sometimes he's God. They are both true. He took on, he partook of flesh and blood because we are part of flesh and blood. So he can die for us and represent us. Friends, there's a reason why God became man. He became man so he can sympathize with you and feel your pain and your sorrow. He became man to show you that he's a humble God. And he became a man because the only way he can die for you in the court of God to satisfy the righteous law of God that demands your death and mine because we are sinners and the wages of sin is death according to the law of God. He could not represent you unless he became a man also. I cannot have a Norwegian uh, lawyer Defend me in a Canadian court. Why? Because he's not a Canadian citizen. I can't have uh, a, an extraterrestrial defend me as a lawyer in a human court. Why? Because he's not a man. And so Jesus Christ cannot justify you as a man because he himself, he cannot represent you. He cannot be your mediator. He cannot be your advocate, your lawyer with God because he's not, he's not man. 
And so to be able to, to represent you, he had to take on your nature and your citizenship. That's why the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, verse 14, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself looked, likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels. He's not Michael, see? But he took on him the seed of Abraham, men. God became man so he can represent you and die in your place on the cross and rise again and justify you. Friends, Jesus Christ is not a man who became God. Jesus Christ is God who became man. Thank you for listening. If you want to help forward that truth, please like, comment, subscribe, share. If you have any questions, you can write them down. If you'd like to know more, you can always visit us at www.hopemontreal.com. Thank you for listening.